I am unashamed. What about you? So we talk a lot on this podcast about the internet because that's how people find us. Um, and so dad, last time we, I, I showed you a, a read Jace, uh, a description of him on his, from his Wikipedia page, which was interesting. It was just some fan looked like had put all this information because half of it was from the show. And then there's a picture, but it's not of Jace. It's of Jep, my youngest brother. Mm. So it was really funny. So, so dad, somebody sent me, since they heard that on the, on the uh, podcast, they sent me, here's another one from the internet. It says Phil Robertson. Before Phil Robertson was the star of Duck Dynasty, he had an impressive career as a college football star. In his native Louisiana, Robertson attended Louisiana Tech University, served as the team's quarterback in the 60s. True, right? True. Exactly. And so here, here's the picture of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's embarrassing. It's close. It's, it's Sai's picture. <laughs> it's it's Uncle Sai, which I wish I had thought to bring this up. He was on the last podcast, but I didn't think about it till last. They wonder left, why so. I don't I don't ever look at a computer. Don't own a cell phone. <laughs> so we uh, we have another fellow internet uh, guest uh, on today. So so Jace is out on assignment, uh, Kyle and. When Jace is, we just send him out, and so he was he was gone the last podcast, and he's gone today. He'll be back on the next one with with tales. We just send him out. He just he just you know every nothing. And I can't imagine what hasn't happened to Jace or what potentially will happen to Jace because he's just a walking story receptacle. I mean, and it's always confrontations, and it's always stuff that ne has never happened to me. And it'll happen to him on one trip. He'll do five things that's never happened to me in my life. I mean, it's... it's so I, he, sh he should have been the pastor, right? Because then he can use all exactly. those every single Sunday. I have to tell his stories. That's right. So we got Kyle Thompson with us today, Dad. And Kyle uh, is has a, um, he, he has a ministry that he does that's called Undaunted Life. And uh, and he's got a podcast, and you're you're up there in our neighborhood. I noticed you had two hundred something podcast. We're about three hundred now. I think this is what is this three fifteen? Yeah, y'all are Und a little undaunted, bit more. Uh, undaunted and unashamed have met. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Where unashamed and undaunted come together. I like it. I go. love the title too. Yeah, it's just something that we're not as prolific as y'all on a on a weekly basis because we're more about a once a week podcast. But we've been doing it since 2017, and right. so you know it was kind of like a side deal for a while. But now it's it's kind of being pushed a little bit more in the mainstream. Yeah, and I love it because because uh, you and your wife came over, and, and of course you got to meet the arm wrestling champion, and his wife were there. So we had a really interesting uh, conversation at dinner last night, uh, just kind of getting to know each other a little bit. And you know, you and I talked quite a bit about because you're 30. Four? 34, yeah. 34. Uh, so you're quite a bit younger than us. And we were talking about last night about how how generationally things are so different now. And, and it's, I mean, you, your ministry centers basically on men. Uh, and and we'll talk a lot about that and, and how good it is. But just tell us a little bit about what, what you think is different about just even how we're raised, what, you know, culturally. Because mm -hmm. you don't see a lot of 30. 30s, you know, I mean, our audience is, is, is working on getting it, but I mean, they just seem to get Kyle it. Kyle fits know? into the millennial bracket, so I said, I don't know about that dude. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they have a, a way of, uh, what's the word, affecting how you think. You're like, what? What what these thirty year olds? What what are they doing? That's so, exactly right. Kyle, you're one of them. <laughs> well, Have at it, man. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm on the older millennial scale, which doesn't actually help, but you know we do get a bad rap and we've earned it. But I, I was kind of telling you a little bit off air. I feel like I've gotten a tremendous education and upbringing from my parents, but I think it was more accidental in terms of, you know, I don't think they which set out. Proves family structure a healthy one is. Imagine that. It's essential. <laughs> Imagine when you have mom and dad in the same home and like, because that's the thing when you have this fatherless epidemic in basically every racial group in the United States, all the statistics for dad being there and all the improvements that are there, they don't even talk about what type of dad dad is. Dad could be a deadbeat. Dad could be a drunk. Just dad being present is the thing that's important. But I would say for me, uh, you know, I, I remember being frustrated that I wasn't getting enough playing time in baseball. Right. And a lot of the other dads, you know, they would go and, you know, lobby the coach to get their son more playing time. And my dad told me, again, kind of this accidental wisdom. He said, son, when and if you earn more playing time, you will have earned it. So go earn it. So go grind, go work harder, but work harder in practice. You go ask Good your coaches advice. like what you could do. And, you know, you're, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old. You don't realize that that's going to be, you know, 
kind of cornerstone advice that you could use for the rest of your life. But a lot of lessons were like that. And for me, you know, I internalized a lot of those things because I never got in trouble growing up for the outcome of something, right? Like a grade or, or a game or something like that. I always got in trouble for effort. So I could go 0 for 4 with three strikeouts and two errors in the field, would not get in trouble. But if I hit a ground ball, a shortstop, and I just kind of jogged to first base, I would get reamed on the way home because my parents didn't care if I played sports, right? <laughs> and also, if I got a B on my report card and it was in a subject I, ha I was capable of getting an A in, I got grounded for that. And, you know, you're thinking, oh, this is authoritarian garbage and I can't believe my parents are this terrible. But that was just, there were expectations in our household about how we were going to act, how we were going to comport ourselves and, you know, basically don't be a knucklehead, right? Which I, I did that sometimes and, and not so great other times. Yeah, I but put a little, I had a little uh, 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 advice for my boys. I said, now boys, you're going to go to school. And I was talking from the first grade on. I said, some, some teachers are great. Some teachers, not so great. Some teachers are poor, not real good. I said, but always remember this. You obey all of them. Sure. Then I would talk about law enforcement, and I told them, you run afoul with your teachers, you have run afoul with me. I said, so you're going to answer to me. So don't forget that. Remember Al, the oh, yeah. speech I gave y'all? Oh, yeah. And I can say that. That's what Kyle's referring to. Yeah. Which it needs to be there. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and you laid out a structure that – authority, you know, we needed to, we needed to fit in and work out our situation. And then you, you were pretty much, I mean, you, you weren't on grinding on us at all. You just expected us to do the right thing. And pretty much we all did. We were all yep. decent students. So Kyle, you came up, did you go to college and get, get your indoctrination like I did? Yeah. So <laughs> the, the funny thing is, is I, you know, I There's was a maze out there, man. <laughs> what well, is in, it's getting worse because, you know, my alma mater, I went to the university of central Oklahoma. That's where I got basically a full ride scholarship. And I met my wife. She got the same scholarship the year after I did went the leadership route, didn't go the sports route, which, you know, ended up working out great for us. But even just recently, my, my university is going to change the fight song because the, it says the word boys in it. And so again, it's, it's not as, you know, it's not as inclusive, you know, our, our female athletic teams are amazing, but there was an alumni that actually went to school with that claim that the word boys was inherently racist because of how that word has been used towards people, uh, you know, throughout history, even though, the, that song was not written with that intent. And so I didn't see as much of it as an undergrad, right? But now I even see my own university that I've given a lot of money to and a lot of time and attention to making these changes when basically nobody was knocking on the door saying these changes need to happen. But it's kind of like what we were talking about yesterday. We, we live in a, a cowardly world where everybody's worried about, you know, a couple of dozen of bad tweets with their name included. And it's like, how are you going to live for the gospel? How are you going to live for the hard stuff? When somebody's not even like, there's not even smoke outside your door, much less fire. And you're sitting here worried about tweets. And so it, that that's just kind of another thing where I feel like a lot of the friends that I grew up with are kind of similar to me guys and in, in kind of how we were brought up. But there are a lot of other people. They're just fragile. They're, they're just fragile in, in their personhood. And the worst thing that's ever happened to them is someone left them a mean comment on Facebook. And you end up with their train of thought without them realizing it with the black spray paint can you have a, you, you carry with you i guess you have spares <laughs> and all you do is just pack. walk by walls if you especially if you're being filmed and it's f everybody f everybody and that's what you leave behind and you look at all the marches the rioting the looting and the burning and then the insignia f everybody i'm like what kind of mind what kind of upbringing what kind of advice? Right. Because they're younger. They seem in their 30s. Or 20s. A lot 20s, of them are in their 20s, yeah. And they're leaving this trail behind them, and you're like, what What in the world is happening to us? We're imploding. Well, you've they've grown up without actual struggle. I think that's part of it. Is So yeah. their parents were out there in front of them, knocking all the potential problems out of the way, as opposed to saying, nope, you, you, you made this bed. You're going to lay in it. Because this and, activist class... Basically, they're, they're, the, most of those are affluent, right? Most of these you see that are mm -hmm. part of these organizations, they come from affluent families and, and usually, you know, West Coast. And they don't seem to be poor and down. They're not. No, because no. they're not working is one thing, you know. So you've got all this time to go protest every day. I mean, mm -hmm. you think about it, does anybody work in Portland, Oregon? I mean, there is, I mean, <laughs> they don't have, they don't have anything in common with these Cuban refugees that are, are not, well, the, they're essentially refugees, but these Cuban people that are in the streets, you yeah. know, hooting and hollering right now. These these affluent 
mostly white folks that are, that are out there doing these things and painting F this on everybody and doing all those different things. These are people that have never built anything. They've never had to sacrifice. And yeah, so it's yeah. super easy to tear things down and to destroy things. It's incredibly hard to build them. And when you, when you have an upbringing that doesn't put, you know, an emphasis on building things that are sustainable, things that are sustainable for other people, not just yourself. You know, quiet life, make it your ambition. The apostle Paul told the Thessalonians, make it your ambition to live a quiet life. You say, to mind your own business, to work hard, as we told you, so your daily life will win the respect of outsiders so that you won't have to be dependent on anybody. What a text. I live by it, and I, I, you try to get that in the people's heads. But, Kyle, it's like pulling teeth, man. You know, quiet life, mind your own business, work hard. You say life would be much better and far less chaotic. When I think you also have people that are, I mean, I was, when I was reading through Romans 12 last night, you basically have these situations where it's like, okay, you know, be of sober judgment uh, about kind of how you are, but also that, that the body, you know, basically do what you're called to do with that's within your gifting. And you have a lot of people that are doing th things that are like, they were not gifted to be an activist because if they were gifted by God to be an activist, they wouldn't be being activists for the thing that they're being an activist for. <laughs> they would be an activist for, you know, being pro-life or anti-abortion. They would be an activist for, right. you know, helping the poor in a way that doesn't, you know, keep that cycle going. Yep. But that's just not something that people really operate with. They're like, oh, I can scream too. I can hold a sign too. That doesn't take any effort. I just have to show up and someone hands me a brick and I just move on. Yep. And you're right. In fact, I just saw today, I was, I think it was a tweet about this group of people, women, they were getting together to have a march to be able to vote. And I thought, you know, Basically, we, we we fixed that one about a hundred years ago. Yeah, we're good there, but but they're still marching about it. I was like, oh, you can't vote. <laughs> I mean, so you're like, really? I mean, now it's just like you know, like you said, it's 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 an activist for things that are already there. That's how silly some of it has gotten. But it's just that mindset, you know. Here's the, here's what the Apostle Paul two thousand years ago, under a, I guess you could call it a monarchy, the the Roman Empire. We've made a we've been made a spectacle. These are, are apostles of Jesus, people who go out and preach the gospel to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. We're fools for Christ, but you're so wise in Christ. These people had had gone awry. The Corinthians, some of them. We're we're weak, but you're strong. You are honored. We're dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry. And thirsty, we are in rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless, we work hard with our own hands. When we're cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. Just think about the kind of heart these people had before us. When we're persecuted, we endure it. When we're slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become, this is the Apostle Paul, who was a murderer, a blasphemer, and a persecutor before Jesus met him personally and changed his mind. He said, up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse, probably if you research refuse. <laughs> dung. <laughs> the, the dung of the world. Well, for our guy to explain what they're going through, just telling people, look, God loves you. He sent you a Savior, Jesus. He's died on a cross for you. He's removed your sin. Every mistake you ever made, he's taken it away. He's not holding your future sins against you. Just confess them to him and move on. It's called grace. It just looks like, and he'll raise you from the dead, so he's destroyed your sin problem, your death problem, and you're cursing me, and you're just think about it the way these people rolled. I feel a lot better being in this camp with him. Hang on, let's take a break. So, uh, I hate it. You know, one thing I hate about the left wingers, Kyle, is they great words, they ruin them. 
Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, things that you see, you love this word and now all of a sudden you can't say it. One of those is the word equity, which we, we've been talking a little bit about, which equity really means, you know, gaining money from some investment or your house or whatever. Now, of course, you got all this crazy left wing political stuff that goes with it. And one of our sponsors is a, is a company called Home Title Lock. And they talk about you gaining equity in your home. And then there are these thieves out there. I don't know if you've heard of this. They're they're cyber thieves, and they go online. They steal your title. You've got equity, which is money you've earned by having this house and paying for it. And then they just steal that, mm-hmm. and, and they take it, and they run up all these things. And then you get stuck with having and they foreclose your house. And it's crazy that it happens. But we we talk about a lot. People invent ways of doing evil, and that's what this is. I mean, taking the internet and figuring out how to steal people's equity. So we want you guys to uh, check check them out. Make sure that uh, that you still own your home. You go to hometitlelock.com, and you're going to register your address. Make sure that you're not already a victim. Then you're going to receive a complete title history of your home. And so it's a hundred dollar value for free when you go there. So you save hundred bucks right off the bat. Hometitlelock.com. Check them out. Yeah. So, I mean, in Romans 12 and verse 16, never be wise in your own sight. And that is exactly what these people are because, and, you know, you talked about the, you know, K through 12 system or the the college system. They are being patted on the head whenever they do things like this, these, these things that would be considered extreme at any other time in history, right? Uh, these things that a lot, a lot of them go to kind of more of an atheistic worldview or uh, literally comes from the pits of hell, some of these ideas. But if that's what you're constantly being applauded for, that's, that's where you're going to go. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy for these people. And it's self-fulfilling virtue. They don't have to worship God or believe the gospel to be virtuous. All they have to do is to change their profile picture to be a black square uh, during the summer, or they have to, you know, stand with this organization or with that that organization. And then you see this creeping into the church as well to where it's like, oh, we're just, we're going to take pieces of this, right? We're going to do gospel and like, it's an a la carte menu or something like that. It's just like... What, like, what are we doing? Yeah, because because a lot of churches have gotten swept up in social justice, um, ultimately even opening the door for Marxism and some of these other things that are happening, which is it's always been amazing to me because America, I mean, churches and, and pastors in particular and vicars and all the different people, I mean, they were the ones that rallied us to even have a country. I mean, yep. it came through those. I mean, th- that's where they were having the militias. It sure did. I mean, they were, the church houses were the thing. All the Ivy League universities were preaching schools. I mean, that's how they, they were training people to go preach. Sure. So when you look at that change in less than 250 years, it's it's stark to me that that that, that was fast. Because you look at Europe and, you know, sometimes it would take, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years for things to change. But here it just seemed to go so quickly from God is really doing this and, and we're people of God to we don't to like you said, F everything. That be so much of our we're young in a, mindset. We're in a sad state. We are. When you mentioned, I think in a previous podcast, you talked about, you know, the, the meaning of the word university. It's unity and diversity. Right. Well, when that was chosen as the name for this institution that was going to be educating people, it was unity and diversity of thought. Yeah. Right. Like yep. that was right. it. Now yep. there is no such thing. And and I'm I'm all for D- diversity. So if, but if you're defining what you need to be diverse based on immutable characteristics, right. characteristics that you cannot change that you had no vote in. Right. right. So that's one thing I, I feel weird when people say, you talk about the, this community or the, that community, and they just fill in the blank with, you know, some immutable characteristics. Like I didn't choose the level of melanin that, that I got when I was that's born. Right. right. But I can opt into the gospel. I can opt into the neighborhood I live in. I can opt into the, to the church I go to or to the university I attend, but to define somebody like I, what could be more racist than defining somebody and who they are as a person based on something that they didn't get a vote in. Yeah. I, I just don't understand how that's a way to operate moving yeah, forward. Right. And when you have churches borrowing from those worldviews, it's so dangerous. Well, yeah. and they, the same people that would, would laud civil rights, including me that now go back and say, well, we didn't mean all that because you had a personal experience about we, we're not trying to be equal. We're not trying to be all one. We're not trying to be, you know, I mean, the, in the same people that would laud Martin Luther King just a decade ago are going completely against what any of the civil rights movement was about. I mean, the idea now with this equity and you know, all the words that they use to change that, it, it's really amazing. Another thing I wanted to talk to you about, because you talk a lot about 
uh, in your podcast uh, about masculinity and how that's now sort of a targeted thing in our culture. And especially with now this gender, who we don't know who anybody is. He's not a he and the, you're a they and you're this and you're that. So talk a little bit about that, about kind of what you try to speak to men about what, what a manly man is and a godly man. Cause I really like that. And I love what you talked about was Jesus a manly man. Cause, cause he's kind of been feminized. As not kind of word. Yeah. yeah I mean, not kind of at all. Yeah, I'm being kind, but yeah, yeah, you're right. He's been feminized by people. I mean, they're just, you know, making bacon basically a wuss right. is the mindset. So I, I guess the short version of the story is I, I became a Christian. I accepted Christ as a teenager, right? So I was, you know, 15 years old. And so around the time I'm learning what it means to be a man, I'm learning what it means to be a Christian man at the same time. But when I looked around the church, cause I went to church by myself, no one else in my family went to church. Um, it's still that way. But whenever I went to church, it looked like the godly men, as far as I knew, they were inside the church, but the manly men were somewhere else, right? They, they were doing other things, right? The, the men in church were, they were a little doughy, they're, they're pretty soft, but their shirts were pressed and, and their, their you know, shoes were immaculate. <laughs> and, you know, they, they'd pray for you, brother, you know, that kind of thing. But the manly men were somewhere else. And so I grew up with this dichotomy that manliness and godliness are not in the same person. And so again, I'm, I'm kind of going over a lot of philosophizing that I did over about a decade, but it became clear to me that the church has become a place for effeminate men to prosper. And that if you're a testosterone filled, virile, like godly man, the church doesn't know what to do with you. Um, and I think part of the thing is, is because there is a tremendous emphasis and overemphasis in, in my opinion on the lamb of God and almost a complete neglect of the lion of Judah. And so yeah. When, when Jesus is depicted as Good this, point. as this dirty, blonde hair, blue eyed white guy, it's like, okay, he's a middle Eastern Jew <laughs> for the, right. first of all. Uh, but you know, he kind of looks like me just with a longer beard he and longer look, curly hair. He didn't look near as pretty as Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, he said there was, he had no beauty or majesty <laughs> to attract us to him. Right. So, you know, the, the blonde, wow. the, the, I'm like middle East over there. Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, uh, <laughs> he was a pretty, pretty dark skinned, rough dude. Yeah. And thank, thank God he was. But and the one that introduced him and paved the way for him was rougher than he was. Right. He looks, makes me look like a school <laughs> child. But that, that's the thing that you see in the church is this overemphasis on this, this lamb character. And the lamb is way easier to understand and internalize, especially if you're a woman or if you're effeminate. But if you're a man, for whatever reason, the line of Judah, which is almost never discussed, is, is never really that just seems like it, it fits with you a little bit better. And, and it's, it's exacerbated. I, I read everything. those texts, Kyle, and I thought, you know what? Uh, I don't know of any reason I would ever need a suit. I said, so I think I'll just forego the suit, <laughs> the suit up because it, 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 what you're describing that's overflowed to where you've got these long robes and flowering robes and people are, uh, it, it's just not Romans 12 in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices wherever you go. Don't conform to the pattern of the world. You to be that way. It If you get it down to going to church for a couple of hours and not showing up until the next Sunday where you show up for a couple of hours, suffer through it. You're bored. They're saying the same thing. The gospel, who knows? But you sit there long enough, and to this day, we still have white churches predominantly and black churches. In the South. I right. told the group we're meeting with, the brothers, half black and half white, which is a good thing. I told them, I said, we're breaking new ground here. We're all brothers and sisters, and we're meeting here together. I said, and when we go out, we need to let people know that. So for you who are homeless, you go out there and you point them to Jesus on the street, you point them to Jesus. So it's a pretty good, uh, uh, one of the bodyguards told me, he said, he's one of the SWAT members. He said, Robson, I don't want to hurt your feelings. He said, but we've arrested about a third of your congregation at one time or another. <laughs> I said, we're trying to, we're trying to help you on that, on that. <laughs> well, I was, I was telling Kyle, I went up to, uh, and I think I've said this in the podcast, but I went up to Oklahoma city, which is, which is where you are. And I went into Dell City. They had this little church plant they were doing there. And they're aiming at, is a, there's an Air Force base there. And so they're aiming mostly at military. And it's called the Branches Church. 
which is kind of a playoff Jesus as the branch, which is a pretty good idea, but it's also branches of the military. So when you walk in, it's a store, like a it used to be a store. You walk in, they got a couple of rooms there, and there's the four military deals, you know, yep. flags. And so they're aiming at military and first responders. I love it. It was great, which is why I volunteered to go speak. But uh, when I got up, Lisa and I got up, we're doing a marriage deal because obviously a lot of military and, and, and you know, police officers, first responders have a lot of marriage issues because – of the nature of the job. You know, you're always gone, mm-hmm. you're deployed. It's, it's a hard thing to build a, a good marriage and, and everybody to stay faithful. And so they want us to do some marriage stuff. And I got up and the first thing I told them, I said, well, I got to tell you guys, I'm excited to be here. I've never spoken in a setting, you know, of believers where on one end of the strip mall, there was a liquor store and the other <laughs> end, there was a cannabis store <laughs> selling pot and you guys are right in the middle. And of course I've said this before. I said, Jesus would call this prime real estate, right? That's because right. because everybody who comes here is going to need to hear what you have to say. But to your point, dad, you know, Rome is well, let's take a break. One of my favorite sponsors, I don't know as much with dad and Jace, but, but I love these guys. You would like it, Kyle, because I, I can already tell I've hung around with you enough to know what you would like this. It's a, it's a, company called Bespoke Post, which is kind of an odd name, Bespoke Post. But they they send you every month this this box of things that, you know, you've told them what you like when mm. you go to their website. But it's like a little surprise. I have a little party, you know, just a little <laughs> surprise party every month when it shows up. And I love it. They're, they call it the Box of Awesome Collections. And they are. I get a lot of really cool stuff. And it's stuff that I'm into. You know, it could be grooming stuff or bar stuff or, you know, grill, whatever you like to do. So what you do, if you want to get started, you go, you take a quiz at boxofawesome.com. That's their website, boxofawesome.com. They're going to make sure you get stuff you like. You sign up. Uh, you can skip a month. You can cancel any time. So it's not like you're locked into some long-term deal if you don't like it. The box costs 45 bucks, but they send you about $70 worth of gear. So you kind of get a value every time as well. So you go to boxofawesome.com. You sign up, you get 20% off your first monthly box if you enter the code Phil at checkout. So that's boxofawesome.com. Enter the code Phil at checkout, and you're going to receive 20% off your first box. Check them out. In Romans 12, you know, we've had a lot of great worship in a dump line. Sure. uh, Sitting around this table, you know. In, in a pickup truck, having the conversation. I mean, that's the idea and the mindset that, that he's with us always. I mean, the Holy Spirit lives in us. And the American church, now the model, kind of tried to, they've been trying to revert back to the temple model since Jesus said, we're not doing that anymore. You know, he said, that's over. Well, and, and you the can thing be is, a real man and follow Jesus Christ. That's exactly really. right. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's kind of the thing that I, I talked about. And, you know, I did a devotional here recently called How to Build a Godly and Manly Foxhole. And that's kind of how to build, you know, guys that are cultivating spiritual, mental, and physical resilience on a daily basis, yep. like around you. But the first four lessons are, what is a godly man? What is a manly man? Can you be both? And was Jesus a manly man? And the, was Jesus a manly man? Like that is worth the price of admission of going through this devotional. And it, it's on our website and it's on you version. And the, the thing about it that's important is that if you don't believe that Jesus was a manly man, then it's going to affect how you worship him, right? And it's going to affect how you think of worship because I, I did an episode called Contemporary Worship Music is for Women and Effeminate Men. Because when, a, when you look at a lot of these lyrics of modern worship songs, if you were to take out the name of Christ and put the name Bob, in there. It seems like you're singing a song, a homoerotic song to your boyfriend. That's what it seems like. And it's like, wait a minute. No, no, no. We're we're talking about the God of everything. We're we're talking about Christ who gave up his body to cover all sins. Right. And we're talking about him like he's this cute guy that we can just roll up and put in our shirt pocket. And it's like that we're not, we're not thinking of him in a proper light. And again, you can swing over way to the other side. You can only focus on the Lion of Judah and have no lamb. So I've never advocated for that. I'm advocating for swinging the pendulum back a little bit to be like, let's talk about who he is. Because think about how silly it would be to talk about Jesus coming full of grace and then stopping. Or Jesus coming full of truth and then stopping. Both are true, right? But you don't get the totality of who Jesus is until you think about him as coming fully of grace and truth, not 50 percent grace, 50 percent truth. That's 100 percent of both. Yeah. Beginning with Jesus and his followers, which were not a great number, 
But these were a tough group of people. Oh, no doubt. I about mean, it. I mean, tough. We talk a lot about it on this podcast, uh, Kyle, because we were commercial fishermen. You know, that's how mm-hmm. we started our. So we understand the nature of four of those guys being in that business and and what that does. I mean, it's it's hard work. It's physical work. It's it's understanding nature and how it works. Understanding how fish swim. It's patterns. It's and all those things. And yet again. I can remember, I've told the story before of we would go down and we would need a certain amount of fish to pay a bill for our company. You know, these are the early days. And mom would tell dad, she said, well, we need, we need, you know, 300 pounds of cat today. And we would get down on our knees and worship our father for daylight in front of a boat and say, Father, we need 300 pounds today. You know, would you send them into those nets? And then we would go out and run our run the nets. And when you get them all in and you could, dad's pretty good at guessing. He said, I think we got it. So he, he, mom would go in, she'd come back and she, and dad would say, how'd we do miss Kay? Well, we got 327 pounds, just enough to go pay that bill. And it was, it was amazing because it, it was never an overabundance, but it was always coming through for what you needed. I, I told, I, I tell people that if I felt like we were raised on manna, you know, but our manna was fish. Well, and it's, that was an act of worship and most people would not categorize it That's right. as such. But I mean, you look to the model, so that's why I kind of talk about the concept of a foxhole. You look at the model of when the apostles were called. So when you go into, into Mark 3 and you look at when the apostles were, were called, there are mandates right there in the scripture that God gave in order for them to be an apostle. And that's to, to be with Jesus, to be ready to preach, and to be ready for spiritual warfare. Those are pretty good calling cards and, and pretty good manners of preparation. Because mm-hmm. again, you, and if you read the scriptures, if you read the gospels, especially deadpan, you don't get the personality of Jesus. You don't get the ferocity of Jesus. My, I mean, my favorite biblical story is John two. It's five verses long, but it's whenever he overturns all, you know, when he clears the temple. Well, if you just buzz right through that story, you miss the fact that he didn't show up with a whip. There's, there's no, there's no description that he no. showed up with a whip. He went and made one and came back. So it was premeditated aggression, which doesn't sound very Christ-like, right? right. Premeditated aggression. It was sustained aggression to clear out the temple and all the animals and people that had to take a while. And also, here's the other thing. So just think about this room. There's not that many people in this room. What would And and the key was they couldn't stop him. That's it. No, that's exactly it. They didn't even try, Phil. They didn't even try to stop. They were like... Whoa. What kind of look did he have to have in his eye? Again, and, and when you think about modern Christ-likeness, it's like, whoa, 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 that's way too aggressive, right? And, and we're certainly not advocating that you walk into the boardroom at work on Monday <laughs> and go turn over tables if you don't like what they're doing. But at the same time, we don't frame Jesus properly, and we don't frame how he operated properly. He, he called out a demon with his voice. Right. That that like that's pretty godly and that's pretty manly. Also, when he reclaimed, I, I can't stand when they say, you know, he rose or Lazarus from the dead. He reclaimed. He snatched him back that's from it, the dead. It, it speaks loudly without saying a word. He was basically saying, Don't mess with me. Right. <laughs> right. And in that scripture, the the Greek word that's used to describe how loud he spoke when he said Lazarus come out is the same word used to describe the storm that the apostle's ship almost sank in. Right. Yeah. So the voice of of God, he didn't say Lazarus, if it's okay, and if it's not going to offend you, um, would you mind coming out here so these people will believe in me? I'd really appreciate that. But that's how he's presented in modern art, in modern artwork, yep. in modern music, is that he's this, he's this ultimate nice guy. And it's like, I don't think if you actually walked with Jesus, that that would be in the first hundred words you would use to describe him. Nice. Yeah. Right? It'd be a bunch of other really, really awesome In fact, we, we, were talk- we were answering some uh, listener questions a couple of podcasts ago, and I hadn't think about it until till we were having this discussion. You know, and someone asked us about when Jesus said, the guy comes up and says, you know, I want to I want to follow you. And he says, well, let's go. And he says, well, well I got to go back and bury my, my dad. You know, and he said, let the dead bury their own dead. We, right. and, and so, again, that sounds so harsh. And so, so rude. we were talking about it like, you know, trying to soften it. And, 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 plus, and we shouldn't. I, I mean, plus, he, he was I don't struggling. usually start my Bible study with you bunch of snakes. <laughs> right. You brood of vipers. Brood right? of vipers. I mean, because well, think about it this way. Like, <laughs> you're going to say that. You're like. He's no pansy, that's right. for sure. That's right. Well, I mean, a bunch of snakes. Have you then, ever said something to a group of people that made them so mad they wanted to kill you? Right? I mean, we see that in scripture that there was a mob that was ready to kill I've, Jesus. I've had them stand up and right. come my way <laughs> and say, and say, well, what would you do if I put my fist right between your eyes? Because you said you would you 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 would have to forgive me. You know, I turned the other cheek. I said, 
I will try to respond like I should. I'll just say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have a weapon, so, so just in case we go there, yeah. let's take another break. But yeah, so I, I think it's that you know there's there's a lot more in the in the text than people realize mm-hmm. about just what you're talking about, and, and people try to kind of explain it away. And well, you know, the language said this, and but but really, instead of just taking it at, at face value, that he did, he didn't when he was serious, he was serious. I mean, he he meant it. He was a man's my man. My plea, my plea for America and the rest of the world, and I, I keep saying this. And it, it so far it's falling on deaf ears because everybody comes up, I don't know how many thousands of different types of denominations that there are, it, but it's splintered and it's divisive, just the makeup of it. And my plea is that surely we could all come together as brothers of Christ, sons of God. And first and foremost, we live by the fact that God sent Jesus to the earth 2,021 years, give or take a few, ago. He died on a cross to remove our sin. Three days later, he was resurrected from the dead. He said this through Matthew, Mark, Luke. I'm going to do this. I'm going up to Jerusalem. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to be buried and raised from the dead. Peter's over there saying, no, that's never going to happen. He says, get behind me, Satan. This is what I'm fixing to do, guys. Why we can't rally around the gospel message and just tell people who Jesus is, what he's done for us, what he's now doing, mediating for us, keeping us cleansed, and then the return. If we could just stand on that, I, I would just feel better about the whole thing. I don't care what they call each other. I would just say we ought to be able to come together and share Jesus and who he is and what he's done, what he's now doing, what he will do. I just don't know why we can't get that accomplished. Well, I don't feel like it's, I can see where you would think it's falling on deaf ears. It's certainly not for someone like me. You know, when I listen to the podcast, that's something I'm reminded of. It's like, okay, can we focus on the gospel and, you know, John 13, 34, 35, can we be defined how we love one another? Is that something that we could focus on? But, you know, I was listening to a podcast the other day and it was, uh, it was too, it's normally a Christian and atheist doing a debate on this podcast. It's called uh, Just Thinking, or not Just Thinking, it's called uh, The Unbelievable Podcast Out of the UK. And this particular podcast, it was two Christians. Well, they were debating, you know, post-millennialism and amillennialism and all that. And so I, I'm like, okay, I'm supposed, I'm supposed to know about these things. So let me just listen to this. And so I got about halfway through and I'm like, I super don't care about this conversation. <laughs> like, because the thing about it is, is like, that's going to be one of those things. That's that my we're in, point. Right. Yeah. When we're in heaven someday, we're going to clink our glasses together and go, ha, you were right. Or ha, you were right. Like th- this, not a salvific issue. You know, <laughs> so, you think about it, Jesus dying for us being buried and raised from the dead. It's not rocket science no. and it's not theological. No. I think there's a reason the word theological and theologian is not in the Bible. Right. It's it just, it, it's not rocket science. It's one person who ever lived, think about it. Your calendar is going to be dated on Jesus Christ showing up. Out of all the people who ever lived on planet Earth, if you can fix it so the world counts time by you, I would say you investigate him. Yeah, it's a pretty simple. It's like Ben Carson told me and Zach, we met him, and he said he was talking about people saying he was going to have a hard time running HUD you know, for Trump. And he said, well, it's not brain surgery. Right. Which is way harder. But but the thing about it this way too, guys, whenever you're looking at a situation and seeing how complicated it could be, it's hard to apply it. Right. So if you're trying to apply post-millennialist mindset to who I vote for, right. That's almost impossible to do. Right. Unless you're just like, okay, binary, they are post-millennial or not post-millennial. But when you talk about in Jesus politics and in the theft of America's soul, apply the gospel to how you think about political candidates. So, you know, with Trump, which I know you, you've talked a lot about Trump and those types of things. Yep. I chose not to vote for him in the primary in 2016 and for the for the general in 2016. I left the top of my ballot blank because I didn't think he met my basic standards of human decency. So I'm going to take my stand and not vote. But then I saw how he acted and legislated for four years. And I also saw the mean tweets and I saw the, the course, you know, commentary and all those different things. But I was like, I don't even know if Donald Trump is pro-life in his heart but he sure is legislating like he is because I can't know the man's heart, but I can read the legislation as it comes across my table. The fruit. Right. The fruit's there. The first thing when I met with him, I didn't, I had three sessions with him. 
but all three were spiritual from one end to the other. Mm -hmm. And he at no time, I'm aware of his caustic personality, I call it, but at the time he listened carefully when I went through who Jesus is, what he has done for you. Uh, Trump, you have sinned, right? I didn't say Mr. Trump. I, he's running for office when I talked to him before he won. I said, Trump, you have sinned, haven't you? He said, oh, yeah. I said, probably a lot, right? Mm -hmm. He said, yeah. I said, I have too. I said, here's, here's Jesus' death on a cross. He solved that problem for you. I said, are you going into a six-foot hole or am I dreaming one of these days? Gunshot, heart attack, whether you win the presidency or not, you're mm -hmm. going down in the ground, right? He said, no doubt about it. I said, the resurrection of the dead is the only thing I've run up on of Jesus Christ that will get us out of here. I said, now, look, I'm open to suggestions. You're running for president. I said, uh, if this doesn't get us off earth, do you have a better story? He said, I do not. I said, I said, don't forget Jesus while you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're doing your job. Don't forget him. He said, I understand. So, but there was no belligerence coming out of him. Like, get that Bible out of my face. What are you trying right. to do? Convert me? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been watching you, you know, and that caustic personality sometimes kind of gets in the way there, Mr. President. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Well, so he listened, and I said, I'm going to vote for him because of his policies, not because of his caustic personality. We all have faults in many ways. Well, and I like the way you put that. That's viewing it, viewing it through a gospel lens will do that because you mentioned the books. Especially in in theft, Dad talks about the big lies that and that's Satan's that he's a liar from the beginning. Right. So some of the stuff we talked about today, the big lie is that there's such a thing as toxic masculinity, meaning that if you're male, you're toxic and you mistreat women. Now I met your wife last night, a lovely person, that, and I saw you guys as you got a little little ba baby boy. And I saw how you were treating her and how she was responding to you. And here you are talking about all this masculinity. And yet you seem like you're, a, if she were here, I'd ask her, I'm sure what she'd say that you're a good husband, a good father. So that's a lie that says, if you're a manly man, right. that you're going to mistreat your wife. Right. Because that's Patriarchy what we've been, that's what we've been taught. That's why I, culture, I made it even with Trump or anybody else. The ones that curse come back and yeah, I love them. I, I don't hate them. The mm -hmm. ones that come to Jesus, you say they're brothers, you love them. The ones who go out cursing out the door, you know, you're no good as them. I, I love them. I, it doesn't affect my love for them at all. Right. I, I tell them about Jesus, the way to get off planet Earth alive, take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. uh, but my, my job is to at least well, inform you. If you're, if you're a seed sower, you, you know, that's your job. It's not about the soul. Let's take our yep. last break. Well, there, there's an easy proof whenever, because you you would think that, oh, a guy's talking about manhood all the time and all these different things. His wife's probably under his thumb and, you know, it's a terrible place. Manhood to be, but, is right. flown away. I'm glad you're talking about it. <laughs> well, when you talk about somebody that has a God-centered masculinity and you walk into that household, the the, the woman is, you know, the family's not only provided for, they're, they're uplifted. You're providing for their flourishing in that at that point. But what we're told is that masculinity in and of itself is toxic. And so I, I love one of my mentors is, is John Eldridge. So he wrote the book Wild at Heart, which is kind of the seminal men's ministry book. And he talked about the last time I had him on my podcast about how when things are dangerous, that doesn't mean you get rid of them. It means you put them in the hands of people that know how to use them, right? So yeah. a gun is a dangerous thing in the hands of somebody that's going to use it for evil, but it's a useful tool in another hand. Plus I have a, a Bible in one hand and an AR within arm's reach 99% of the time, I want a Bible study with you. But if you come in, the dogs bark and the glass is breaking and you're coming in with weapons in your hands. Different scenario. I, the Bible studies off. Not, we, we, with the Bible right. studies now off. Now it's a gunfight. It, that's and, a gunfight. And so the the important thing about talking about this masculinity stuff is not to you know overemphasize. Hey, men, you need to you need to you know ride four wheel drive and you need to eat jerky and you need to do all this. It's not the the, <laughs> the that's the caricature masculinity yeah. stuff. I don't care what you're into. I don't care what your hobbies are. I care about whether or not you cultivate spiritual, mental, and physical resilience on a daily basis. And if you are living a God centered life, those are things that are a little bit easier for me to see and. Uh, Part of the thing that helps is my wife, Kelsey, she's a lioness. Like she's down. She's down for the call. She's not fighting me in this because she's not listened to the whispers. What did you say, Kyle? She's a lioness. A lioness. Right? <laughs> so, I she, like it. But she's not, she's not listening to what culture is telling her about what her husband is. Right? So 
have I done some toxically masculine things in my life? You bet your tail I have, right? Yep. And those are things that that Jesus paid for those sins. I'm too. guilty as charged. Absolutely. Yep. And so, but she is she's down enough for the cause of what we're trying to do and what we're trying to build because she sees the changes that are being made in a life. She's known me since I was 18 years old. And so whenever people listen to our show and they make some of these changes, the women will send us emails and say like, Hey, you know, he's making these changes. What are you saying? What are you doing? And it's like, we're just readjusting where they're focusing their masculinity and we're putting, you know, we're putting more oomph behind it. I guess you could say. I get a ton of same emails of unashamed listeners. And a lot of it is their wives. uh, And they say, you've helped change my husband's life. And therefore my life is better. And it's really interesting because you would think, again, if this lie of Satan was true, that w- once people listen to us for a few hours, that they would just be terrible. They'd be this patriarchy. And, I, right. and their wives are saying, thank you so much, because my husband is becoming a godly man. And now I know he can lead me and lead mm-hmm. our family. And so, it, it, but again, it's just, that's what Satan does. He, he, he puts the lie out there. So that's the whole thing we've been talking about, all these evil ideologies that are go- being you know, kicked around in our, in our current era. The other, they're, they're all lies. The other day I got a letter and the wife of a guy said, Miss Robs, I know this sounds crazy. She said, but my husband has been hollering about the last couple of years. He said, the only person I'd let baptize me is John the Baptist himself. He said, it's cause I'm looking around. I, I don't, we've run out of men here. <laughs> so she goes and gets a picture of me off the internet. Those in front of him, she said, what about him? He <laughs> seems pretty close. <laughs> he looks down there. He lines it up. I said, I got Dan on it. We lined up a time. He drove down with his wife and his 15-year-old son, 14, I think, 15. I said, son, uh, you're coming with your daddy here. They showed up. We, we we had a slot for them. A lot of people hollering around here. So, And they had some other woman with them. But I go through the gospel with him. And he said, it's the greatest move I've ever pulled in my life, Robs. And he said, but I, he said, I was just... I was trying to think, are there any men left? I said, oh, there's men left out here, and there's more than me. That's I right. said, you just got to have faith, my man. That's right. There's the, he, the father and the son. His, his wife was a daughter of the God Almighty already, but there's a father and his son. And we went on there, and we prayed on the side of the riverbank after baptizing him in the river. He wanted it old school, basically. Yeah, yeah. And I, so I, I, I've lived up to what he wanted. So it's it's a great thing when you see it, man. Well, and Phil, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create this groundswell with Undaunted Life and with the podcast, Undaunted Life and Man's Podcast, you. because it's we want to give these men the tools Y'all are to be able to great. push back darkness. Keep it up. You know, I, I really appreciate that because, again, if, if we're going to be able to push back darkness as men, we have to have the right arrows in our quiver. Yeah. And so whether they're fighting back against CRT and their local school board or Plus, something Plus, uh, Kyle, we're somewhat better off. Then these cows were homeless. I mean, they were finding a meal, you know, and they all were killed. All of them were slaughtered. I don't mind going out for the cause. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. So yeah, maybe, we, maybe talk, happen. we talked about that last night. Kyle and I were talking about what people call persecution in the 21st century because somebody mean mouths them on yeah. Twitter. Yeah. You know, this handful these of these guys <laughs> before us. I it's mean, not persecution. No. I mean, you can't. In fact, it's, it's to me, it's immoral to even try to make that comparison right. about right. somebody not liking me or saying something nasty about me versus yeah. what these guys went through. Yeah. I mean, you want to read a book that'll change your life. Read tried by fire. That's a, that's a yeah. book that details the first thousand years of church history. And you know, we're sitting here worried about mean tweets and bad comments on Instagram. These were people that were being buried alive, boiled alive, you yeah. know, drowned alive, being pulled apart by horses. And it was all because they refused. And, and the interesting thing it about these be stories, worse. it can be way worse. But the, the most sustaining thing from these stories is I didn't find a single story of someone recanting their belief in Jesus Christ. Because right. at this time, especially in the first century, these weren't people that heard about Jesus. These were maybe one of the 500 that saw him. Right. Yeah. And they know what they saw. There was no doubting anymore at that moment. So it's like, you do whatever you want to this body. Cause I know where the rest of me goes. And, and even we've talked about quite a bit, even the 12, uh, you know, I mean, they, when you see the resurrection, when you, when you get it then, and once he left about what he was saying, I mean, they would have done anything. Oh, I mean, yeah. th- there was no turning back for those guys. Why we, did they change so quickly? And why did they finally all come together and say, I'll die before I will shut up? That's exactly right. And they built the foundation for us. So uh, undaunted. We love all of y'all listening. We love every last one of you. You know, we're trying to get you to see that there's some few good men left. So, so uh, undaunted life's mission statement. I love it. It says, is undaunted.life equips men to push back darkness with content 
that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So in our last couple of minutes, why is that your mission statement? What, what, you know, why, is, why does God put this on you and then now using you to do this? I feel like there needs to be a revolution of manhood inside the church, and I'm not the one to do that, I'm gonna, but I'm going to play a, play a part in it. And that, yeah. that's part of the reason why we're doing this. And men don't have a target to shoot at, and so we're giving them the target of cultivating spiritual, mental, and physical resilience on a daily basis, and we go more into what that is. But equipping men to push back darkness. Again, there are men that want to push back darkness, but if they get asked one question, so the pro-life issue is an easy one. So it's like, yeah, I'm pro-life. Well, what if she's raped? Oh, I mean, I guess in that case, we could kill the baby. It's like they fell apart immediately because they didn't have the, the arguments to say. And so that's why like the scripture is sufficient for us to explain everything and the gospel is sufficient. But guess what? You can't argue against critical race theory if you don't know where it comes from. That's you don't right. know that it comes from critical theory, which comes from the Frankfurt School, which comes from right. Marx and Engels. And, you know, th those are the types of things is like we want to give you the tools so that you can push back, whether you're pushing back at work, in your in your own household, at your church, whatever the thing is, we want to make sure that you're equipped and you're ready to go. Well, I just want to uh, recommend to our audience to uh, to check Kyle out. Uh, you got you some stuff you. on YouTube as well as uh, that I checked out and loved. And then uh, in your podcast as well, because you have some really interesting people on there talking about these very things. And so I could tell last night, I told Lisa, I said, because she had she was over there cooking. So she had met you guys. And she said, did you meet Kyle and his wife? I said, oh, we're already friends. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we, it took about five minutes to realize I like this guy. Uh, and you actually met Zach first, which is cool, which is how you wind up on our podcast. So we really appreciate you making the trek down here and um, just keep doing what you're doing. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.